have capabilities to do that too. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So. So it's almost time. I'll give it just a couple minutes to see if anybody else is joining and then I'll start. Uh, meanwhile, I will share a, a, a slideshow with you. You can tell me if you all see it here in a second. You see that, I hope? We do. Great. Um, at least uh, a few people showed up, Alexis. That's good. I want to thank you for sponsoring it. Uh, it's always helpful. I am just glad you're here. Okay. So, uh, Janessa is, it, is here, and Lauren, and then Angela. Well, hi, folks. Uh, Hello. Are you all beekeepers or are you thinking about beekeeping? We're Hi. thinking about beekeeping. Okay, cool. I've had bees for a couple of years, but have never been able to successfully get them through the winter. Ah, okay. So you'll like some of this. Um, what was that? Oh, looks like someone else connected. Hi. Um, not sure who it is yet. Hey guys, I'm Angela. I, I can't figure out how to get my video on, but I, oh. I've uh, never done bees before, but I've always been interested. Cool. Yeah. Um, I hope I can, I hope you can get the video up so you can see the slides. Oh, I can see you. I just, I can't, it looks like my camera's muted, so you're not going to be able to see me. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's fine. Just as long as you can see the slide. Awesome. And I see Jan is on now. Hi, Jan. Welcome. You're muted, by the way. But yes, I just saw that. Also, I got to change my name. Oh. <laughs> I, my name is Janet, but you can call me Jan. That's fine, too. Okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> did, do you have bees or are you just thinking? About I do it? not. Um, uh, I've been interested in it for a long time. A while back, a couple years ago, I wrote a story about beekeeping uh, for the Solon Economist. And so oh, okay. I've been fascinated ever since. Yeah, and yeah. Um, yeah, so we're my husband and I are, are wondering if this may be the time to jump in and try it. Okay. So. Well, they are fascinating, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'll just jump in and start. My name is uh, Ed St. John. I live here in Solon, um, actually out by Swisher, closer to Swisher, I guess, Swisher, Shuiville, Shuiville, you know, uh, uh, by uh, Iowa to Sika in that area. Um, been here for 32 years, I think. Um, been doing beekeeping for like 10, I believe. Um, I'm with the Iowa Honey Producers. Uh, this is my district. I do... Uh, uh, typically sessions in person, uh, but because of COVID, we're doing Zoom sessions. I'm glad all of you have time and showed up. I think it'll be interesting. Um, we'll run these as, as long as people are interested in questions I can, can answer. So we'll kick it off 
maybe. <laughs> uh, okay. First of all, these are a couple. Uh, they aren't honeybees. Uh, they're mason bees. And you can get these in your garden. They have tubes that you can put in your garden for mason bees. I put these pictures here because I think they're really pretty. Uh, and these are really old bees. You can tell because their wings are all beat up. Uh, but they're very colorful. Three things you'll see on the top of their head here very clearly. Uh, our ocelli, and those are eyes. So the bee has five eyes. There's two compound eyes and three simple eyes. Um, just trivia. Um, bees go way back as far as people using them. This is from a medieval transcript talking about a beekeeper, and you can see the beehive and the bees he's putting in. And uh, the monks uh, use bees. In fact, and uh, William the Conqueror in England taxed everyone and they had to pay in honey or beeswax. Uh, every farm, every peasant had to have some bees. So they've been around and been useful for a long, long time. My background, uh, I've been, I, I, it says 15 colonies, actually I'm doing 14 colonies right now. The best education I've had uh, since I've been doing this is uh, my mistakes and that will happen to you so when you make mistakes don't worry about it other than that i'm a master beekeeper from the university of iowa the university of montana i'm sorry um i've gone to a whole bunch of conferences and and did uh, some beekeeping um, courses with a guy in illinois who's a master beekeeper so that's where i'm coming from to talk to you uh, about um my experiences and how to keep bees. Because if you get 10 beekeepers, you're gonna get 15 opinions. And I want to let you know where my opinions are coming from. All right, I'm here to meet uh, wonderful, exciting people such as you are, to become rich and famous, uh, to save the planet, to save my bees and to educate and amuse, um, really to save my bees. And you'll understand that more as the course goes on. Because if I can get you to be a good beekeeper, then my bees will be healthier. And why are you here is the question. Sometimes you just want to be a backyard beekeeper. If you have kids and you have hives, you can paint them. You can see the painted hive here. They have contests for, uh, for hive painting. Sometimes an Iowa honey producer has it once a year. Um, if you're into woodworking or you know someone that is, you can do it more inexpensively because wood, the wood and parts for beekeeping are expensive. Uh, if you're into environmentalists or science, for science, it's really great to teach kids about science because bees are so intricate and so complex and do so many wonderful things. Um, religion, uh, every, every, seminar I ever went to, there was always a table um, with religious folks talking about how bees prove the existence of God, and it's all different uh, denominations that do that. Uh, some of the biggest discoveries in beekeeping was from um, um, religious people, and we'll get into some of the history there. And sometimes you just want to know your food and what you're getting, so if you keep bees, you'll certainly know about honey. If you're only keeping bees to get honey, though, uh, as Adrian the Bee Man says, uh, uh, don't do it. Buy, find a local beekeeper and buy honey there. Uh, it's, it's better. Make friends with a beekeeper. Uh, the real reason is because they're, they're so amazing. They're really are interesting insects. Okay, so... Normally, I would I would go into a, a different spiel here. Uh, I just gave a thing on spring management to the Beekeepers Association down in Iowa City, and I want I don't you don't need to take notes or anything on this, but I want to give you some background so that you'll see where I'm trying to get to with you with the education aspects, um, because you're going to have disappointments. You're going to have failures where you can't get your bees through the year, through the winter. Um, and I think I can give you tools or ways to work through that. 
because bees, when you have them, they're like a, uh, they're, they're livestock and you have to treat them like livestock because they're expensive. Uh, you got to pay stuff, pay for equipment for them. And so you want to treat them like livestock and not just insects. <clears throat> um, so this, this session I just gave, and I'll go through it. I only have a portion of it here. But this is to give you an overview of, of what's happened. Um, so all the people that supported uh, the Eastern Central Iowa Beekeepers Association down in Iowa City uh, reported they had 123 colonies starting last fall. As of March 8th, they had only 60 colonies. So that would be less than a 50% survival rate from the winter. Um, but that 50% is even lower because there were two outliers. One was uh, uh, where 14 out of 14 hives survived and another was where 22 out of 25 hives survived. So you can see that the very low survival rate and people get depressed by that. Um, I'll skip what that's about. Um, feeding, spring management. We'll get into this later in my presentation. Uh, most bee losses in, in, in spring are from starvation. Uh, you'll learn about how the queen lays eggs and the worker bee has to keep those uh, eggs at a certain temperature. And in March, there isn't much food around. Um, but let me see. Here's this is important. Bees in the spring will be around flying around and foraging about 60 degrees. At about 57 degrees and lower, they start clustering in their hive. And the colder it gets, the tighter that cluster gets. And they vibrate. All they do is vibrate to, to generate heat. Um, and they move around in that cluster. So the ones on the inside that are keeping the queen warm will move to the outside, and the ones on the outside will move to the inside. And that way, they all stay sort of warm, and they're trying to keep that cluster at 80 degrees. If they have eggs, or larva and then larva and they have to keep it at 95 degrees. So what happens is they go through food very fast and rapidly trying to keep all that heat generated. Uh, above 50 degrees they'll fly out and do cleansing flights and then if it turns cold or if they get too far away from the hive they die and you'll find them on the snow. So This is a picture of some of my hives. Um, in 19 and then this last winter. So you can see comparable snowfall. Uh, comparable winter, our winter is pretty average. The pink is above average, the green is average, and the purple is below average. And as you can see for November, December, January, and February, uh, most of it's pretty normal. We had the polar vortex in February, the bottom right, where the temperatures got very cold. Okay, um, we knew that was coming. If you're a beekeeper, you have to pay attention to the weather. So what I did, well, I'll get to what I did in a second. So for March, your typical temperatures are below 50 degrees and bees will be clustered, in other words. Um, so what happens, oh, I think I'll skip this. These are my bees from 2020, and as you can see, it's March 10th, uh, and they survived pretty well. I had met multiple hives. So this year, uh, like I said, solar vortex was coming. I checked all my hives to make sure I had sugar boards so that the bees that were out there could have food when it got really cold if they needed it. Because bees don't break their cluster, they move in their cluster, and if there's no food close by, they will starve to death and free, or freeze to death, rather, in cold weather. Um, so I wanted to make sure if, if they were up on the sugar board, they had enough sugar. If they aren't up on the sugar board, then they're on honey, and, and I have to assume they will move. Most bees move up in the hive, um, so they will move up eventually. Um, I had 14 survive out of 14. 
Uh, one colony is really weak, and I wanted to just show you what these pictures look like really quick. So um, you can see uh, different populations on different hives. The one in the upper left is pretty dense. Uh, one on the bottom left is so-so. Uh, it'll it'll survive and it'll it'll be okay uh, in another month. Um, there's a couple more uh, reasonable populations for uh, for overwintering on March 6th, or March 8th, whenever I took these pictures. Um, and then these were uh, three more hives. You can see the one on the bottom right. They've eaten a lot of their sugar board. On, on February 2nd, only one hive had bees on the sugar board. And on March 6th, all of them had bees up on the sugar board. So um, that means they needed food. And Sorry, had, this is a silly question, but is that white sugar? Yes, the white portion is sugar. Hmm. It's a sugar board. The way, uh, I'll go back to it in a second. The way I make my sugar board Let's see if I can find it. Um, right here. See, I use uh, two cups of water, one tablespoon of vinegar is on there, 10 pounds of granulated sugar, and a candy thermometer. And then you, you heat the water and mix the sugar, and it gets pretty thick. Uh, if you get it to about 230, make soft candy. If you get it much higher, then it becomes harder and harder candy. Uh, you don't have to use sugar board like I do. Um, there's a whole bunch of recipes on the internet for sugar patties. Uh, you can just put a piece of newspaper across the top frames and put granulated sugar on that, and they will eat through the newspaper and eat the sugar. Um, or you can put powdered sugar up there. Um, but the key is, is spring management or the winter management is you want extra food for them if they need it. And we'll get we'll get into this in, in detail. Thanks for the question, by the way. So that's all sugar. The white stuff is sugar. Do you just open the top and pat it in there then once you've made the candy? No. Uh, if you look at the bottom right here, you yeah. can see that that frame is has a has a depth to it of about an inch and a half. Right, you can right here. Okay. Um, so we make that in our kitchen. Uh, we put a ball jar right here in the center so that nothing leaks out. And then I pour the sugar board in here and I let it solidify. And then I put that back on the hive. Now, this is just in the winter. This isn't a summer, uh, it's called the inner cover. This is a winter inner cover that I use. Uh, there's a summer inner cover. Uh, you, if you use these in the summer, you won't have sugar in here. And what the bees will do is they'll put comb all across this. And wherever there's space, they will put comb. And you don't want that. So the summer inner cover is much thinner. Uh, and this is, a, I thought it was Nosema. I talked with the state apparatus. And he says, ah, he thinks it's just dysentery. He doesn't see, he hasn't seen that many cases of Nosema. You have to test for Nosema. This is uh, bee diarrhea. Uh, when it's cold, they can't go fly, right? They can't, they can't cleanse themselves. Um, and they will not necessarily uh, poop in the hive. They try not to unless they get sick. And obviously these folks are sick with dysentery. If there's a good pollen bloom, uh, they will clean that up and they will be okay. And then here's my weak hive that I mentioned. Um, it is weak. Well, and I won't be able to find out what happened until it gets much warmer and I can tear that apart. So what I'm trying to do with, with this course, and you'll see uh, we have inspections and you'll go, it may not make sense at times. What I'm trying to do is give you the tools or the reasons why bees do things so that when you look at your hive, you can figure out, should I do this or should I do that? Because it's more than, I don't want to just, I could give you the mechanics and say, oh, you got to buy a bottom board and, a, and some frames and you get a package from so-and-so 
and you can go stick them in there and uh, you can put some sugar water on top and they'll, they'll survive. And that's the mechanical aspects of it. I'm trying to give you some of the uh, information how bees work so that you can keep them alive. Courses like uh, TSC will run a course on bees and what they're basically doing is selling the, the equipment. Uh, brood chambers. Okay, we'll come back to that. Uh, so yeah, those were those were um, just a background of where I'm trying to get you to, so you understand. So these are a couple of my dogs from 18, and they're still around. Actually, the one on the left is my most favorite dog ever. Um, so if you have questions, don't be frightened. I don't fight. That's the question here. And this looks like they really don't like each other, right? And this is the most famous pose of all. Do you know any of you have dogs? You'll know what this pose is. This pose, you can see the one on the right there, this dog here, is doing something to the dog on the left. And what he's what he's doing is he's doing a play bow. It's called a play bow. And he's saying, come play with me. And the result of that is this right here. They're just play fighting. Just a bit of trivia. Got a question there? Are we talking about bees or dogs? <laughs> well, right now we're talking about dogs, but we'll be talking about bees in just a second. <laughs> I just threw this in. Maybe they'll tie together somehow. <laughs> All the things that Mr. St. John takes care of. Don't be afraid of the bees, Miles. <laughs> so this is a pause, and now you're going to go back to some nitty gritty for us, right? Oh yeah, we're gonna start. This crowd is ruthless. Sorry. I can see that. That well, I just the the key here was don't be afraid to ask questions, right? Mm -hmm. I thought this picture was apropos for that. I don't bite. You can ask questions, but then I wanted to say, well, the dogs <laughs> really aren't mean. Uh, Iowa Honey Producers has a really great website with a lot of information. Um, there's an organization called BeCounted.org that sells a lot of technology. You can wait, have gives your weight and hive temperatures to your smartphone. Pretty pricey. Uh, there's an organization called BeInformed.org, which is a collaboration of universities. Oops, sorry, and they have a lot of good information, a lot of good charts. Uh, they survey the whole country and you can get data as to who has what disease at what time in the year, how many hives are surviving. Very, very good or um, website, beinformed.org. Do you keep a thermometer in your hive? Like, do you know what the temperature is? No, I don't. Okay. I don't. Um, um, you don't need to. Uh, um, just like the weight's interesting. I, I when I was getting my my master's thing from University of Montana, I used them uh, to measure weight and hive every day. Every uh, it takes a sample like every ten minutes, and you can see when the bees leave in the morning, you lose several pounds of bees because they're out foraging. If they swarm, you lose a whole bunch because you lose honey and you lose bees. So you can watch the weight, and it's interesting. Isn't essential though. Um, so here's the course setup. There's a mechanical portion that we'll talk about with what the hive consists of and how you put one together. And then there's the understanding I'm trying to stress that bees are livestock. And you need to understand, at least get a concept of what's normal and what isn't normal. And then I want to do, show you how to do hive inspections. Hive inspections are very important issue though is you need to understand the hive and it's various stages inside the hive and and so we'll look at the stages of brood whether or not you have enough adult bees whether you have a good queen whether you have water forage and food what stressors are stressors are disease or bugs or predators or viruses and then space so we're going to touch all those and I'm trying to give you some background in each one of those um, as to what what's good and what you should be looking for. And, and it may not make sense at first. I will also send um, 
out an inspection sheet of paper that you can use. It's from Bayer. Um, and it helps you remember what to look for when you're doing an inspection of a hive and to take notes. If you're gonna have a hive, have at least two. Um, so you can compare one with the other while you're doing inspections and see what's normal and what isn't normal. That's a recommendation. <clears throat> okay, so this is where I try to dissuade people from beekeeping. And then if they say, oh, that's okay, we'll really go into it. And the reason I try to do this is so that you don't buy bees and get disappointed and have them die and say, oh, why did I do this? Bees cost money, all right? A package, I think anywhere from $125 to $150 for a three pound package. You got hive components to put together, uh, you know, several hundred dollars there. You can spend thousands of dollars on gizmos. I don't recommend it, but you look at these magazines, like if you go to manlake.com, uh, that's M-A-N-N lake.com, good company up in Minnesota. Uh, they have lots of bee products. I, uh, I get stuff from them all the time. If you're gonna do medication, which you have to do for mites, it could cost uh, anywhere from 20 to $100 a year, depending on how many hives you do. Um, and then if you're gonna extract the honey, uh, rather than just scrape it and drain it, uh, you know, an extractor is gonna cost money. So you could spend, a thousand to two thousand um, dollars getting set up easily, um, but that isn't the big part. The big part is the work per week per hive. You're going to have to look at your hives every week, or at least every ten days, and you know, and that's inconvenient. Uh, I can't even do it sometimes because others oh, it rains or I have some place to go or I don't feel like doing it. <laughs> um, so you gotta have a commitment to, to, to treat them like livestock. So assuming that you want to move on with beekeeping, here's what a new package looks like. You can get a package that comes in a box like this with a sugar can with a can of sugar water. That can will be inserted. And here it's being pulled out. Those are bees. That's probably a three pound package. You can start with two pound packages. I recommended three pound package. Um, and I'm gonna show you what you do with that. So what do you need for basic equipment? You need a veil, you need gloves, you need a smoker, you need a brush, you need a hive tool. I don't know if you need a brush right away, but you'd, you'd certainly need a veil, gloves, smoker, and a hive tool. And some people buy a uh, bee jacket, which is good, or bee pants. You know, if you're going to be a, a beekeeper in Germany, uh, which is interesting, uh, you're not allowed to use a veil or gloves or um, a bee jacket because they believe that if you're a good beekeeper, you won't be stung if you know how to treat your hives, how to handle your hives. That's pretty true. Um, and over there, they, they run courses, and it's very special people that they get to be beekeepers. Okay, the smoker. Um, the smoke calms the bees. What it does is it causes them to go eat more, and if they eat more, then they're, they're calmer because they're, they're eating sugar. Um, that's what they need. What to burn in it? Uh, I recommend buying material from Man Lake or one of the many bee people, uh, bee product catalogs, and using their material. Otherwise, you can use dry leaves with pine needles, um, things that will burn and smolder and cause smoke, uh, but it's very hard to keep it lit. It doesn't last very long. Whereas some of the professionals, the manufactured stuff uh, is much easier. Um, but you need a smoker. And don't 
be too frustrated if it keeps going out. If you can't keep it lit, you can't get the right amount of smoke. It takes time. It's one. Of, it, it's more practice than anything else. That's bee glove. Those little brown spots there, you can see. Those are all stings. Uh, in a hive that was uh, I was trying to rush through, so they were stinging me a lot. Uh, I would have never made it in Germany. So the top one's a top bar hive, which is sort of fashionable. And, uh, Did the stings hurt? Uh, yes, they do, just for a little bit. Okay. I have a portion on stings later, but they do hurt. Um, my wife can hear me swear sometimes when I get stung. Um, they only hurt for for me for like 60 seconds. They burn like a match would burn on you uh, for me. And then that's it. I mean, it doesn't swell up. It doesn't get red. I don't itch. Uh, but I've been stung a lot for a lot of years. When you first get stung, it's going to swell up. It's going to itch. It's going to be sore. Uh, but then your body adjusts to it eventually. Did you get uh, bit through the stings with that? Oh, no. Uh, um, once in a with while, you, no, once in a while, it'll come through. Uh, I don't wear, I don't wear, I wear just Levi's, so they'll sting me through my Levi's sometimes. Uh, and then when I take pictures, or I don't always wear gloves. Sometimes I don't wear gloves and they'll get me on a knuckle or something. So mm. um, if you squish one, right, because you'll see that they're really dense sometimes and when you're handling them, uh, if you get one underneath your finger and you squish it too much, it, they don't, the girls don't like that and they'll sting you back. Um, so, oh yeah, so this top hive, it's called top bar, I don't recommend it. Um, it was developed for use in Africa. I think I have a picture of why they use it there. Uh, it's, bees don't move sideways very well, but they do. I mean, you can get them to do that. We're going to be focused on the most dominant hive in the in the U.S., which is Langstroth hive. Uh, right here's a picture of it. It allows easy inspection. It allows you to move all the honey frames. It lets you move frames between hives, which is important. And this is uh, this is called a 10 frame deep. And a 10 frame deep has 3,500 cells on a side, so 7,000 on one frame. And there's 10 frames across. I'm not going to recommend that any of you get 10 frame hives. Um, unless you get just mediums, don't get deeps. Um, I had some, I have some, uh, they're just a struggle. They're so heavy. You have to be a, a horse to move them around. I've gone to eight frame hives. Um, and now most recently we've gone to a lot of mediums, which are smaller. Uh, they're the same eight frames, but they aren't as high. They don't have the height just because of the weight. I, I'll talk about that in a minute. Here's where our top bar hive is in, in Africa. You can see it here in the middle where they hang it up in the trees so the animals can't get it. It has a use there. It doesn't have too much of a use in the US. All right, and this is where we get into the priest. Major beekeeping advances were in, in beekeeping. I mean, tremendous breakthroughs were done by religious people. Uh, one was this Polish priest by the name of Dreisen, and the other was a Presbyterian pastor by the name of Langstroth. And here's some trivia. I like trivia. Alexander Graham Bell and Elisha Gray, who invented the telephone? Does everybody know? I bet you think it was Alexander Graham Bell. Um, he got the patent for it. It just so happens Elisha Gray got to the patent office in the morning and handed his patent application in for the telephone. And then in the afternoon, Alexander Brent, uh, Graham Bell heard that Gray had been to the patent office and rushed down there and handed his in. Except he talked to the clerk that took his patent material and said, could you timestamp this and put a date on it? Which they did. And of course, Gray's didn't have a timestamp on it. 
So when they issued the patent, Graham Bell got it. Bit, bit of trivia. So the same thing happened with Dryson and Langstrap. Dryson had all this cool idea about B space, major discovery. Just think, this is in 1850. We had bees in the Roman times, in the Greek times, throughout medieval Europe, and nobody ever figured out bee space. Um, and Dryson was in his communications with Langstroth. They write back and forth. They're both beekeepers. And they figure it out together, really. They figure out this major discovery. And what it is, is that if you have a removable frame and you have another removable frame and you keep them about three-eighths of an inch apart, the bees don't build comb. They use it as a highway. So they build comb on the frame and a comb on the frame, and there's a space between them that they can move around. And that is terrific because that makes the frames movable, inspectable. Um, if you've ever seen a skep or a natural hive where they didn't have frames for the bees, to control the way they make their comb. It's just this mangled mess of um, bee comb because they put it everywhere and they, they make it in every direction and there's no way to look inside and see what's going on. So the way they, up until 1850 or so, you know, 1800, what they did was they destroyed all the bees to get the comb up. Well, now you didn't have to destroy the bees. You could take the frames out and get your honey Put the frames back in and the bees would just keep working. So in 1852, Langstroth patented this, this hive. We still use it today. Uh, Iowa State Code uh, says that you have to keep bees in containers with movable frames to, pro to provide ready examination. Um, I know people that don't. Um, I had a guy swear to me a couple years ago, I have pictures of it, about this beautiful, he made some beautiful hives out of an inch and a half cedar, uh, used a different technique, but he said, oh yeah, yeah, natural hive, natural beekeeping, we don't use frames, we just let them build the comb. Um, and then he would call me and say, oh, I have a problem, but I don't know how to get to my, <laughs> my bees. And I go, well, I can't help you. Because he had it like five feet tall, imagine five foot tall with different portions and the comb is from one segment to the next segment to the next segment. So you can't even break them apart. Um, so that's why this Langstrap hive is so terrific. Uh, here we talk about your physical limitations. All right, and now I'll come back to that. So the traditional setup is you're gonna have uh, vertical frames, you're gonna have a bottom board, and you have boxes for brood and for honey. Uh, and this is sort of a typical setup. We'll start at uh, A up here, and this is called a telescopic cover. Um, most hobbyists will use this. If you're a commercial guy, you'll, call, you'll use something different because you'll be moving, the telescopic cover hangs over the edges of your hive, uh, whereas these other covers only go to the edge, and that way you can put them on semi-trucks easier, um, which we'll get to eventually, just to give you a, like a, what do they call it? Um, when they throw a tidbit out in a show and then they don't tell you what, what happens until the end. 90% of all bees in the United States are on semi-trucks. We'll get to that again. So this next thing, B, is an inner cover. You'll need that. See how thin it is versus the inner cover I use for sugar? Very thin. People don't always use uh, a board sugar cover. Sometimes they use a piece of burlap, um, something like that, because you don't want the bees going up into the telescopic cover and making comb. C is a honey super, uh, and you'll have more than one on your hive. Um, hopefully, you'll have more than one. D is called a queen excluder because the queen's down in these brood boxes in E, and you don't want her getting into your honey, so you use a queen excluder. 
uh, a lot of people call them honey excluders too because they do reduce the amount of honey you get. Um, I started out using queen excluders. You don't need them. Uh, yet be careful. You will certainly get brewed once in a while up into your honey, but you can manage that. There's ways to scrape it out and things. So a queen excluder is not necessarily needed. I do use them when I can't find my queen and I just have to, because then I'll put an excluder across each box to find out in a few days where their eggs are. And once I find out where the eggs are, then I can say, oh, there's a queen in this box for sure. And then uh, E is, well, I'm sorry, E is, is your brood boxes where the queen is laying eggs. Um, these are 10 frame deeps. We'll get to why I don't recommend that. And then this bottom board here is F is a, a bottom board. You don't need uh, G, which is called a hive stand. What you do need is a couple bricks, concrete blocks, something to keep the hive off the ground. Right. You can buy some very nice hive stands for a good price too. Since beekeeping has become very popular, uh, the suppliers have found it to be a great revenue stream. Um, you can get your stuff assembled or unassembled, painted or not painted. Um, you can get woodenware, which most beekeepers use, or polystyrene, which is uh, 10 frame or 8 frame. Uh, 8 frames are not all uniform. Man Lake and Better Bee are the All 10 frames, no matter where you get them, will always be the same size in width and length and height. Eight frames, not so, because they haven't established a uniform width. So Man Lake and Better Bee are a little bit wider than Brushy Mountain, who's out of business, or Miller Bee. So once you start getting an eight frame equipment from somebody, I actually like Man Lake because a little extra room, you'll see where it helps in inspections. And I don't get a kickback from Man Lake, but they're a good company. Um, and then you can get medium height or deeps. And you can see there's about three inches difference in the height. A lot of folks are going to medium height for all the boxes. That way they don't have to have different size boxes. It works the same. You just don't get as many eggs on in your brood box. And you have to move them around more often. Um, I use both. I use deeps and mediums for brood boxes, uh, but I only I use the eight frames basically. It's all about how much you you want to carry and, and lift, and it's heavy. A ten frame hive full of honey can weigh 60, 70 pounds, and that'll be on top of your hive. It'll be four or five feet up in the air, and to lift that off several times a summer is just a pain. So here's your bees in your uh, three pound package. You'll notice I keep pointing this. This is a can of sugar water. It's set in there and the bees will be drinking it. That's her food. I don't know if you can see it. There's a little slot here. What that slot is, I'll have a piece of wire on it and there'll be a cage in here right in the middle where the queen is hanging. Um, when you get a bee package, it will unnerve you. The first one you ever get will unnerve you. You'll be nervous. You won't know how to put it in your hive. Uh, that's all normal. So you can get a package or a nuke, established colony, a swarm. Most likely you're gonna get packages. All right. Um, this is just that if you buy used equipment, they're supposed to be inspected because used equipment can have some bad diseases in it. Um, so if you really trust whoever you're buying it from and they had bees and they didn't die off because of disease, go for it. But if you don't know and somebody's just trying to sell you equipment, be leery. 
most of the bee organizations in Iowa, at least in the spring or midsummer, will run auctions of equipment. And those are pretty decent. All right, there's a bee package again. I'm going the wrong way, aren't I? Okay, when you install that package, you're going to need a hive ready, a hive tool, a spray bottle with one-to-one -one sugar, uh, granulated sugar dissolved in it, a bale, a bale, a feeder, and an entrance reducer. All right, here's what it looks like in your car or truck. You can see the, the box over here with bees. They will buzz. You want to keep them in a cool uh, dark spot. You don't want them in the trunk where they'll get too hot. If they get too hot, you'll die. Your bees will die. Right? Um, I have a pickup truck, and I put them in the back seat when I when I when I bought packages. I you spray them with a little of that sugar water, and they'll settle down, and they'll be fine. I'm surprised he put them on his seat here because they they do poop through once in a while. Uh, keep them in a cool, shady spot while you're transporting them. Spray them with the one-to-one -one sugar to keep them calm. They'll, what happens is you spray the bee, the other bees will groom it. So they're grooming each other because they want the sugar water. So this is where you're going to get nervous. You're going to have bees flying around. You, if you've never done this before, uh, it's it's unnerving the first time you do it. All right, you got this bang box of bees that want to fly out of this hole. So you want to take that box and boom, down, pretty sharp on the ground. All the bees will fall to the bottom. You pull that can out, and then, of course, you put a cover over it so that all the bees don't fly out with it. All right, you don't need that can anymore. You get rid of it. It has holes in the bottom that feed the bees. There, you can see... Uh, this person is pulling the can out and at the same time is removing this um, cage that has the queen in it. All right. And you put the cage with the queen someplace on the grass where it's cool, but not in the sun because sun heat will kill bees. All right. Spray your bees with the water. Um, and then, well, here's here's the same thing. See, and this has a, a piece of car, a cardboard or wood over it, so she's taking uh, it off with a hive tool. All right, and this woman is very brave. All right, <laughs> she's obviously put a lot of bees in in hives, but you can see she has her brood box here. She has only half the frames in it. All right, and she's got the bee package above it. Undoubtedly, she's already removed the can. She's taken that, so there's a hole opening. She's going to take that, and she's going to go like this a few times and knock all those bees into this box. What's going to happen is a lot of them are going to fly up, but that's all right. That's where you get unnerved, right? You want to put the package right in front of the hive here, and there shouldn't be too many bees left in it. Any bees that are left in will come out and go into the hive, and you can see the entrance reducer here. You only want to leave an inch or, or two inches most open so the bees can go in and out. Uh, you really want to reduce the entrance. So you want to shake all the bees into that box, into the brood box, and then you're going to put the covers back on after you put the queen in there. So here's uh, another installation picture where they're shaking the bees down between these frames. I would have recommended taking a couple additional frames out. You're gonna keep those frames out for several days because the bees are gonna go in and they're gonna form this lump. And if you push frames in, you're gonna be squishing all the bees. So you just leave the frames out for a couple of days until the bees migrate to all the other frames. After a few days, you'll replace the frames, and then this is what your brood box will look like. 
Don't force frames in the first couple days because the bees will be in that cluster. Ah, now here's what the queen's going to come in, some type of cage. There's plastic cages, there's wood cages. Most of the packages come with plastic cages. Uh, usually when you buy a queen, they come in a wooden cage. When you just buy a single queen. Like I will, in the, in the spring, I will go and buy 10 queens uh, from a company out in California. Uh, all our bees are made either in California or down in Georgia um, and Florida. Those are the places where bees are made in the U.S. all winter long, and then they sell them to everybody else. Queens are made uh, both in those. Queen, queen business, making queens is a big business. Um, All right, so the queen's in here. Uh, I'll go back here. You see this white? That is a sugar um, patty that's pushed into a hole. All right, so that the bee can come out of this hole. The other bees can eat this sugar, and they will, to let her out. All right. So here, and usually, I, you can see it here. There's a cork here on this end. And you can see this, all this white, this is another type of package, all this white is sugar. You got to take that cork off if you have this type of setup so that the bees can eat through the sugar and get to the queen who's over here. When you put this package, regardless of the type of package, into the hive, you have to make sure that the area where the where you can see the queen is accessible to the worker bees because the queen will die if she doesn't have attendance she doesn't know how to feed herself she doesn't know how to groom herself all she knows how to do is lay eggs all right she doesn't know how to drink water so the work with the other girls all the worker bees are girls and they will feed her they will groom her through the wire they will will take care of her poop through the wire. They will take care of her completely. But she has they have to have access to her. So here you can see the retinue of bees on the queen in the hole. He has a couple nails here. And you can see he's he's gonna put this between a couple frames. And this is an established hive that he's requeening, but the concept is the same is that He's going to leave access to the bees to this screen so that they can get to the queen. And there he has it suspended between two frames. Um, now you're going to have a box installation where you don't have all the frames in yet. Uh, so half, let's say half of those frames won't be there. You'll still want to hang that that queen between two frames so the bees can get to her. And it's pre the first one time you ever do it is be unnerving. I'm just telling you, uh, you'll be nervous. There'll be bees flying around. You won't know if you did it right. Don't worry, they're forgiving. Here's a plastic cage with a queen in it. Here's the sugar that I was talking about. So you're going to have to hang, put a hanger on this to hang it in the beehive. It should come with a hanger in your package. And then, of course, you're going to get your bees in April um, or early May. I prefer uh, sometime in April. You know, if it rains for two weeks, they're all going to starve to death because they don't they don't forage. You only have three pounds of bees, so that means you won't have that many foragers. Uh, so you're going to have to keep them, keep them fed somehow. Uh, this is a top hive feeder. There's Boardman feeders. There's a whole bunch of different types of feeders with sugar water. Um, I think I have more later on, on types of feeders, but you're going to have to make sure with your new package that they're fed. Right. You're going to put them in, in this hive body. Um, 
you're going to leave them for a couple days and you're going to go back to make sure they accepted the queen. Uh, they accept her by smell, by her pheromones. So if they don't accept her, they will kill her and, and then you're sort of SOL. Um, unless you, unless it's an established hive, because then they'll take an egg and make a new queen. Um, don't leave the a queen in her cage alone for too long. She will die without attendance. Always remember to take the cork out after a few days, inspect to make sure the queen got out and that she's still in the hive. That's by pulling the frames out very carefully, looking them out, see if you can find her, which shouldn't be too hard in a small hive with not too many bees. And when you find her, put her back in and things are good. Be mindful to feed. Feed, feed, feed. Once you get a good bloom, you don't have to be so worried um, because they'll take care of it. Then. They'll prefer um, pollen from plants um, and nectar from plants over sugar water. So here's a nook. That's a pre pet This is these are the easiest way to start a hive. They're most ex they're most expensive too. Those are all bees, there'll be larva, there'll be a queen in here. You just take it and you transfer those frames into your brood box and uh, you have a small colony already set. Uh, they may run $200 or more for a, for a nook. But if you don't want, I mean, it's a hive. It's a really small hive. It has a queen, has eggs, has larva, and has worker bees. To uh, install it, you just put it in. Okay, here. Here's a different type of feeders. The one on the, over on the right is the Boardman feeder, which is probably the most common for starter, for obvious, to start out with. Uh, it fits into the outside of the hive. It's liquid. The bees go in and, and eat the honey or eat the sugar water. It's okay unless it gets really, really cold. So that's why I'm saying mid-April to late April. Um, uh, for your packages and for feeding. Uh, this is a pale feeder. This, these are different types of feeders that you put inside the hive. Um, I think I've used all of them. And they're all reasonably good. Um, the most important thing for your bees is nutrition. I see we're gonna end in like two minutes. Uh, clean water is the very most important, okay? Make sure you have clean water. I have a bird bath about 100 feet away from my hives. Uh, and I fill it every day in the summer. Uh, the bees will be around it. If, they, if, if you have a water source that's close, it's good. If not, they will be on your neighbor's pool. and Your neighbor won't like you anymore um, because they need water. In the spring, you're gonna feed them one-to-one -one sugar water. In the fall, two-to-one. Uh, the reason it's two to one in the fall, sugar to water, is because it's a little thicker and they don't have to dehydrate it because when they're putting sugar water in the comb in late September, early October, they don't have a long time to evaporate it and it isn't really hot out. Um, I'm going to stop there for tonight if that's okay. If you have any quick questions, I hope. I'm giving you what I need. If I'm not, yell at me and tell me what you want. Um, and I guess next Wednesday at 8 o'clock we'll be starting. 8 to 9, right? Wednesday and Thursdays. Is that what everybody understands? Yeah. Question for you. Sorry, go ahead. I, uh, as for time, I thought the web page said Tuesdays and Thursdays. Oh, was it Tuesdays and Thursdays? They haven't uh, marked wrong, wrong. They have it marked Tuesdays and Thursdays from six to eight is what oh. I saw. Okay. Um, Just have the library fix it. Call them tomorrow. I will. I will because uh, I had a note that it was Wednesday and Thursday, but you know, I told them I was available whenever they needed. So uh, I, I was told Wednesday and Thursday to eight to nine too. Okay. I think okay. it's I just 
I think it's advertised on the calendar Tuesdays and Thursdays, eight o'clock. Okay, I will call and get, try to get it straight. I will do whatever you folks need. Just like if you miss a session, just give me a drop me an email and we can make it up in a half an hour because I can do a half hour zooms uh, with with without an account. Um, so I I want my purpose here is to make you good beekeepers so that you're you don't get frustrated. You can keep good bees. Um, and you enjoy the hobby. All right, that's my whole purpose. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you have, so much. I have a question. We might get cut off here. Um, we, I have two neighbors with pools, but there is a pond closer to where I'm going to put my beehive, hopefully. Do you think that the bees will go for the pond over the pools, or do you think I still need to put a water source closer to the beehive? I think you need a water source closer to the beehive. Okay. Um, um, they will, will go for water. Um, and I have uh, two, I have one in front of the house and one in the back of the house, uh, for, for what, for bird bath. The one in front wasn't intended for the bees, but they use it. Uh, the one in the back was cause it's, it's pretty close to where they are and they, they use them both. Um, so yeah, they, they find a source of water and they'll keep going back to it. And you don't want them over in a neighbor's pool, for sure. So they prefer pool water over pond water? Uh, that What they prefer is the edge where they can sit on the edge and drink the water. Mm -hmm. And in a pond, it's pretty hard to do that, right? Where I have a picture, you can see a, a bird bath, and they're all lined up around the edge drinking. Um, Got it. So. Cool. Thanks. Sure. Why is it that when you... Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, why is it that when you um, start them out, you have the entrance reduced? Oh, because they're a weak, they're a weak hive, right? Yeah. And it's cold. It's probably April. You don't want them to, you don't want a lot of a draft through there yet. And okay. because they're weak, a you don't want them absconding so easily because they got too big a hole and they they, they think the hive isn't suitable. They have to accept the hive too. And mm -hmm. Other bees, bees are, are notorious, uh, notoriously lazy. So if other bees in the area find a weak hive, they will raid it because okay. that's easier getting honey from a weak hive or stuff from a weak hive than it is going out and foraging it. Yeah. So that's something that you worry about in August. But when you have a brand new hive, you just worry because they're weak. Yeah. Well, do you, do you actually buy a weak a reducer or do you just what do you put in there oh i i buy reducers okay uh they they fit across the entrance um okay. and they're and they're made so that they have different size openings one has one inch opening and then you flip it right it has like a three inch opening um, okay so uh, that's what i use okay i have a quick question um we live near Lake McBride, like a hundred yards from it. So that's a huge water source. I don't think there's any pools around. I do keep a bird bath for birds. Um, would the bees go to the to Lake McBride? Say, no, I because the, the key is, remember they have to drink. So they have to get on the edge of water. Otherwise they'll drown, bees drown. Okay, they well, can't hover above and drink. No, they like have a to. Bird. <laughs> no, no. They can't. No, well, I'll tell you, with my bird bath, I'll get birds and bees at the same time. Yeah. Uh, sometimes uh, the bees don't realize what kind of trouble they're in with different types of birds because they'll be eaten. Um, I have deer that drink out of my bird bath every morning. You know, and it's so convenient. They just come up that way. They don't have to find <laughs> water. And, uh, There'll be bees in there and it doesn't bother the deer at all. It's really interesting. Hmm. Um, yeah, we get a lot of deer too. They um they tend to eat the seed out of the bird feeders. <laughs> yeah. Like there were eight of them out there and we started giving them old apples to uh. keep them away from the bird seed. Anyway, that's another problem. Um, 
I would have a concern about other bees and hornets. We have quite a few of those. Um, like after I get my flowers going, you know, a lot of them are perennials and the bees just kind of pollinate them. And on good years, we get really lovely blooms from nature, from the bees. And I see the bees every morning um, buzzing around. And there's a few that that sort of becomes their territory. And then we will have the mud daubers and paper, occasionally a paper wasp, but mainly mud daubers, uh, like in any kind of <laughs> where the, the wall of the yeah. house meets a ceiling, there's yeah, a mud dauber, yeah. you know, and we so, knock them down a couple, will those inter, would those interfere with a hive? No, bees, first of all, bees, uh, they may have a territory, but they actually forage for pollen and nectar in about a three to five mile radius of their hive. So they will go out, okay. uh, say on average, three miles to find something mm -hmm. uh, for- uh, Yeah, I remember nectar. reading that. Okay. So okay. the mud daubers, the hornets, the, the bees have one, um, remember you reduce the entrance. Part of that is because some of the bees at the right age have a task. All bees have a, have a job and there are guard bees, there's nurse bees, there's undertaker bees. And the guard bees, their job is to sit at the entrance and make sure alien bees, you know, bad stuff doesn't come in, they'll sting it. So their job is they sit at the entrance and they do that just become the, just before they become foragers. So their job is to guard the hive. That's why you want to reduce the entrance also so that they don't have such a huge area to guard. Um, the, do you know if there's any bee hornet interaction ever? Like do hornets uh, ever no, try the, to raid the honey or something? The, the biggest, the two biggest problems for bees, one is out in Seattle, uh, which is the murder hornets. I think yeah. they're called murder hornets. Yeah. It's something that was new. And, that, and that's going to be a problem. They're going to try to figure out how to uh, make sure they don't get here because they they'll wipe out a beehive apparently. Mm -hmm. They're like three inches long. They're just huge. And then, um, oh, it has two wings and it flies and I can't think of the name of it right now. It's just, you know, how you lose the name. Um, they're an insect. Help me out. Um, Not mayflies. No, no, no. They're big. Um, I have them all over the yard. I never used to have them until I had bees. Um, oh, Locusts? What? Locusts? No, no, no. They, they have two two sets of wings. Dragonflies? Dragonflies. 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 Oh, yeah. Dragonflies. They spear bees and eat them. They'll fly and spear them. Oh. It's pretty interesting that while they do that. But, um, uh, yeah, you won't. I don't think you have a problem with the hornets and things. Um, the bees will be at the guard, will guard the entrance and keep other. Uh, they'll even keep other bees out, or they'll try. Um, unless a bee comes with honey, and then they let it in because they want the honey. So uh, it's interesting. <laughs> they can. That's why you want to reduce the entrance so they can guard it. It's one of the one of the reasons. Is it so, important to have beef, like the beef food that you can get or make? A uh, pollen. Yeah. Uh, is that important in the spring? Like, do they need that or does the sugar no, water? No, care? for um, to start out, it isn't. If you have a whole bunch of established hives, you can, you can, you can spur their egg laying on with pollen, but okay. then you need to keep putting pollen out because once they run out of it, they can't feed the larva. They only use pollen to feed the nurse. Uh, they use protein for the queen mm -hmm. and the young bees eat protein. The nurse bees, uh, and they make uh, food for the larva out of protein. But once they get like 20 days old, they only eat honey. They only eat sugar, and uh, so that's sort of the demarcation. Uh, and foragers only only eat sugar. So those are the bee. A bee in the summer will only last 40, 42 days. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll get into since that. So you go through a whole bunch of life cycle, a whole bunch of different 
populations in the summer with bees, right? Because they're only lasting 40 a month. Yeah. So that queen has to keep laying eggs and making making more brood and making more bees. Mm -hmm. But we'll get into that. If the bees reject the queen, then you just have bees and a bunch of in a hive with no queen. How what would you do to kind of salvage that situation? Well, that's if you notice it right away, there's things you can do. Um, what happens if they don't have a queen for about a month? All the worker bees have ovaries, ovarials, and they have like six tubes in each ovarial. They're very um, degraded, I guess you could say. Whereas the queen bee has ovar two ovarials with uh, two ovaries with like 400 ovarials, 400 tubes, and she can mm -hmm. lay, lay her body weight in eggs every day at the peak of the summer. So yeah. that's all she does is lay eggs, right? Yeah. So after about a month, because of the pheromones and the hormones, a couple worker bees will develop the ability to lay eggs, but they won't know where to lay them necessarily or how to lay them, and they can't be fertilized. So all you wind up with is drones and you basically lost the hive. Whereas the queen, she goes on her mating flight. She mates with like a dozen male uh, bees, drones. And then she saves that sperm for the rest of her life in a, in a sperm sack in her. She keeps it viable so she can fertilize eggs for two years. Hmm. Pretty interesting. So once the hive is is established, she will leave it, go on her mating flight. No, um, well, you, when you get her, she should already be mated. Oh, I see. Okay. She should be mated already. She's ready uh, to to roll. Uh, once they're mated, she never leaves the hive. She only uh -huh. goes on one mating flight. She comes if she gets back to the hive and doesn't get eaten or on a car windshield, she never leaves that hive again. Unless they swarm, then she goes with the swarm. Mm. Um, so there is a case where she does leave it, but she's she's bound to the hive. In fact, you know she gets pretty big and fat, mm. and if they're going to swarm, they put her on a diet, make her skinny so she can fly. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> uh, mm. Okay, so I'm assuming it's next Wednesday. If it's not. Uh, I'll see whatever the library says we should see. I would give them a call and you get them to put the right days and times. I will so do everybody's that. on the same page. Yep. I, right now, I think it's Wednesday and Thursday, but we'll see what they say. Okay. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. Much. Okay. <laughs>